studies at Chris Lent University. Some things are just resource, and I think I have one in the studio. Sir, it's a pleasure having you here. Thank you very much yeah. for having me. It, it's good to have you here. Um, yeah. Time's on us, and we must run. The first question I want to ask you is, as a Nigerian, when I observe the nascent democracy in Nigeria, I think that there might be a conflict between our politics and our democracy. And chances are I might be mis... I might be mis I might misunderstand the Nigerian reality to that extent, or am I right? And it's not just my perspective now. It's assumed that there might just be a conflict between our politics and our democracy. What do you say? Absolutely correct. I mean, there's a conflict. Um, and I would like to put it 30,000 feet that the S democracy... Sir, could you move closer? The democracy we Thank practice yeah. um, is governed by two things, the politicians and the constitution. You know, ah. the constitution of Nigeria is actually the abattress itself. Democracy is good, but the way you manage your own democracy depends on your constitution. Mm. And the constitution of Nigeria actually did not really help because um, it's tilted or skewed towards uh, nepotism and what we call the federal character. Which is sometimes a little confusing, or, yeah, federal character. The implications of what that means, really, if you would speak on that. Yeah, um, federal character is supposed to be good if it is well managed, you know. Federal character means that, okay, there are some aspects or some people in Nigeria that are not really opportune, or they are not at the same level of development as the other ones. So if you look at uh, the northern part of Nigeria in the 60s, they were far behind in terms of education and uh, development, you know. And the southwest were a little bit ahead. So the federal character was to balance it up and to allow those people that are less privileged mm -hmm. to you know, have the same opportunity. But I think I it's been almost um, 50 years now or more, and we are still doing the same thing, albeit the wrong way. You know, if you look at this present government, uh, if you look at federal character and look at the appointments in government, it's absolutely ridiculous. You know, they're yeah. not following it at all. Okay, so I'm going to create a, a slight detour, really. Um, first, I, I want to speak on your experience as one who has been through um, what I would say the corridors of security. You have taken it up as a course in life. You've traveled the terrain, high and low seas. I mean, you're a naval commodore. I think you've seen storms, you've seen tidal waves, even tidal waves on ground. Um, there's got to be something about security, one, that makes you quite passionate about security on one hand, but two, maybe also conflicted because, um, come to think about it, you work for the government. And so sometimes you may, might have opinions that you can't air which I think puts you in a very interesting position. <laughs> so so it's, 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 how, it's how your journey through the study of security has affected you as a person, because I want to go into the case or the issue of insecurity now. Please go ahead. Okay. Why are we where we are? Yeah, that's a very big question. Why are we where we are? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to spend like three hours to tell you where we are today, <laughs> <laughs> but I know there's no time. <laughs> Um, but let, let me really make it, uh, I'm assuming that I'm talking to you know very educated audience, yes. so I will take it at a higher level. Uh, three things governs why we are here today. One is the Nigerian constitution. Okay. That's number one. You know, the second thing that brought us here is the Nigerian defense policy. Sir? You're going to have to move closer to your mouthpiece. I'm so sorry I interrupted your thought. It's okay. Yeah, and then you're going to have to go ahead. Yeah. Um, the, I mean, you got the first two? Yeah. The third one is the practitioners themselves. That's the, the politicians. They are the ones that actually brought us to. Those are the three things. The Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has amended in 1999. Okay. The Nigerian defense policy or a strategy as we may call it, and the practitioners of the democracy in Nigeria are the ones that got us to where we are today. It, it's quite obvious that something is out of kilter. Sometimes the expectation, at least 
from the perspective of the people. Being on radio, I've had the privilege of hearing people have a thing or two to say about what they think is happening. So, so f when I l observe what the people are trying to say and hear what the government is doing, it, there seems to be something out, out of kilter. What exactly is not as it should be? Because we have heard too many cases. And to be honest with you, every government can be, any government can be stretched. And to give it to the Nigerian government, I think that they are doing what they can. But it's obvious that what they are doing doesn't quite appear to deal properly or thoroughly with the issue on ground. So the people say, well, the government is not doing enough. I think it's more complex than you are looking at it. Okay. Yeah, it's a very complex issue. If you want to go to, to the World Cup, you will try to bring forward your best 11, isn't it? Absolutely. The democratic process in Nigeria does not guarantee that we never brought forward at any time our best 11 into the political sc uh, space. So if you are badly governed, I mean, the result is always very obvious. We are just badly governed because the process itself is skewed, is faulty. Oh. Um, the delegate system, as you have seen, you know, I mean, always bring up the worst character in the system. What well, is not the best? The worst character, yeah, always, you know. So when you are badly governed, I mean, it's garbage in, garbage out. So it's a very simple process. Once you don't, okay. if, if you must tinker with the electoral process and maybe do away with the delegate system and let people choose the people that can govern them. Hmm. This delegate system has kept on bringing forward the worst character in the system. So it might appear that this is more about policies and maybe the individuals who implement or carry out policies. Or because I was just about to ask you, isn't it possible that this might be a case of a lack of something on the part of the military, which we're going to come to because we've heard, for example, um, we've even seen videos where some military personnel will say oh, we don't have enough arms. Um, some have even quit. We heard of, you know, military officers who chose to quit. Some, a few ran away. And re even recently, I heard of military personnel who were at some point choosing to make a deal with the devil. Now, cutting deals with even Boko Haram members. So it, it doesn't quite appear that our problem is even straightforward. But maybe if we can deal with it at the root. So that's exactly where I want to go to. The root. You say, you have pointed out one. You said the politicians. Yeah. So we have, there's, a, there's an angle of this that's political. Isn't there an angle of this that can be structural? It, it, it's not going to be as straightforward as you look at it. I, oh. I, I've been in the military for 35 years, and I know what goes on there. Okay. You know? um, the recruitment process is faulty now. The promotion mm. is faulty. Appointment to strategic appointments. Appointment, promotion, and recruitment. That is where the problem is. And if I'm going to explain that, it's going to take a lot of time. And I can understand But that. it's straightforward. Appointment of military officers, promotion to the next rank, and how do you get people into the system? How do you recruit them? What quality of hands do you really recruit into the army now? Mm. Or is it just list from the Senate, or list from a minister, or list from Asurog? Those are the people you put in the system. So it's garbage in, garbage yeah. out. You get in the wrong hands you're going to get mm. into trouble what we're seeing is what we call theater and discipline you bring in criminals into the system you give them uniform give them arms they're still going to be criminals yeah as long as the politicians kept on tinkering with the recruitment process into the army navy air force we continue to have this stupid thing you're talking about. So it's even probably not even much of a constitutional problem. I mean, of course, the constitution, because you spoke about this whole federal character and how that is an inlet into what we see today and don't necessarily approve of. Yeah, federal character actually has been corrupted. You know, the people that came up with these federal character principles, they, 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 they meant well. Mm. But along the line, you know, the politicians hijack this federal character. You know, if you go to ministry, departments, and agencies, you see some people from a particular part of this country dominating those sphere, or some people of a religious, you know, inclination, you know, dominating those spheres. But that was not the original intention of federal character, and I think it's overdue. 
I think it's time that we do away with the federal character principle in Nigeria so that we can get out of these um, challenges that we have today. Okay. I'm of the opinion that our defense agencies are mm -hmm. capable. I, I think Nigerians are also persuaded that the agencies in Nigeria are capable. But it doesn't quite appear. Or maybe it's the news that's not doing them the favor or you know it's not maybe it's the bad press or the, the speculations the assumptions the fact that if it's happened once happened twice happened three times happened four times now it happens at a pace where every nigerian assumes it could happen now it seems as though that they are capable but something implies otherwise what do you say yeah i think it's just the politicization of um insecurity in Nigeria, you know, it has been politicized, you know. When you look at terrorism uh, and you look at the defense policy, mm. it, they are skewed, you know. The defense strategy of Nigeria is completely skewed, you know, in favor of external aggression. Now, mm. when you now have the men uh, that have been trained in a particular doctrine, a way of life, a way of fighting, and they are facing a new asymmetry, you know, as we have today, and they're not equipped for it, that's one of the things that are responsible. That's at the theater level yeah. or operational level. But at strategic level, I think we have a situation where, you know, people call in a thief to come and rob in your house. Then you call the police to come and arrest the thief. And later you call the thief that the police are coming to arrest you. So <laughs> we have a very complex situation of a landlord calling, you know, a thief to come and rob the tenants and later calling the security people to come and arrest the armed robbers. And as the security people are approaching, the landlord also called the armed robbers that, you know, I mean, they are coming. It's a charade. It's a political charade where some people feel that they can dominate another part of the country by bringing in fighters from Sudan and other places to come and intimidate their opponent. And after 2015, they abandoned them. When you abandon them, they're going to fend for themselves. So we start having a bank robbery. We start having a situation where people will be kidnapped for ransom and so on. And with time, there's what we call copycats. People start saying that the easiest way to make money in Nigeria is to just capture somebody and demand for 100 million. So now we are here. The politicians that started it are pretending they don't know what is happening. And those boys in the bush, you can't really punish them, arrest them, take them to court because at the court they're going to they're going to do what? They're going to well, tell yeah, the stories. Uh, okay, I was wondering if they would appear for here. Right? <laughs> no, no, no. Even they appear for. I mean, that's why they have never been tried. Have you seen any terrorists or any of these people been tried in any law court in Nigeria? We have people that have been arrested in the yeah. past, and they, they have never showed up in the court. The reason is what I've just told you. In the court, the lawyer is going to ask him, who are you? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm from Sudan. How did you get to Nigeria? Oh, somebody paid my way here. Okay, how did you get armed? Somebody did this. Uh, names are going to be mentioned in the law court. And that's why they will never be tried. Wow. You will never see them in the court. So I think that it's quite nuanced, though, but it's necessary to separate the line between banditry and terrorism in Nigeria. I think that sometimes there is um, a, this is, this a tendency to tend to lump them together. I, I feel, for example, what happened in Owo recently, um, the news has reported once too many that these guys, whether they are from a certain tribe, a few a select from a certain tribe or a few within from a certain tribe, um, you know, mingling with other foreigners going or moving from north to south. And we've heard things like because recently uh, the prelate of, uh, uh, of a church in the in the southeast, said something that one of the bandits told him, or one of the terrorist members said to him, he says, oh, we're everywhere now in the south. We're just waiting on orders. So now that is pretty much what the government has recently now termed terrorism. Now, I don't know if you have any answers to who, what, and why. Uh, the answer is in the air. It's all over the place, you know, on the internet, you know. Um... Ooh. 
if you look at what happened in Sudan, Southern Sudan, Northern, you, you see that there are some tribes, you know, that feels that um, they have to be resettled in Nigeria, you know, mm. and it's, I mean, it's not something I'm saying, it's all over the internet. Yeah. And that um, Nigeria happened to be the, the choice place for them to, to settle. And that's why we are having this situation where, you know, they are all in the bush, you know, and the government is not doing enough to, you know, eradicate them. The question you should ask is, why is the government partisan? Why are they looking the other way? You know, then maybe the question I would even love to ask is: yeah. Some people have accused the government of using kid gloves to deal with the issue. Some people say that the government is not bold enough, resistant enough. They're not. They're not dealing with the issue with the measure required to impede this flow of bandits and men who love the concept of banditry, and those who have taken the liberty to make themselves not just bandits, but terrorize an entire nation. Some people say the government is not doing something. As an insider. Yeah. I believe what uh, General Sanya Bacha said, you know, when I was in the system, that if banditry or terrorism is going on in the States for more than a week, um, then government knows about it. Um, my belief is that we can flush out these people, but the military as it is set up are subordinate to the political class mm. and they cannot do as much except the political class actually you know, show willingness to eradicate these people. Uh, I think it's just lack of political will. It's not problem with the military or the security outfits. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's not a problem with the security outfits. Yeah. It's not because the because they are capable. These are men oh, who they, know exactly they, what to I do. Mean, I said it before that, you know, I basically brought to the end the issue of Niger Delta Militancy. I was going to go there. That was during uh, Yaradua's time. So if this government want to bring this to an end, uh, it will end. The Niger Delta Militancy was more serious than this because of the terrain, you know. Mm -hmm. These are creeks and you have to go into, you know, lagoons, creeks and mangroves and so on to fish them out. And it's always so difficult because the creeks are so many in the Niger Delta mm -hmm. that they can easily ambush you and so on. Uh, but we look critically at the problem and we decide to solve it in a way that even the Niger Delta militants never expected. Which I'm about to ask. So what's the difference in pattern? You are capable of solving that. Now people from the Delta can pretty much lay their head at night to sleep. And this seems to be taking a little bit more effort. And even soldiers. It's like we hear it every day of Nigerian soldiers die. And in my head... We can't, well, I, I understand that they have a duty to nation, but I think many t times that their death can be, can be stopped. Like the, the numbers at which we lose soldiers, we can mitigate that. Yeah, I think it's the dimension, uh, the political dimension. If you look at the Niger Delta issue in 2007, Yeradua is, I mean, from the north, and this problem was in the Delta, and he wanted to end it because we were losing soldiers. It's just now that we have this social media thing. We lost so many of our men in Niger wow. Delta. Yes, we so many of them. Zaki, Biam, Woody, and so on. But, you know, the social media wasn't this, you know, you know sensitive then. And Jared you know, decided that, no, we, we can't be losing so much resources, you know. The, uh, the crude were being, you know, posted everywhere, and the marine lives were going, and he was dispassionate. Now, this problem was in the Delta. The president happened to be from the North, and we're able to resolve it. Now, the problem is from the North, and the president is from the North. So I think you can begin to see yeah. that it's a matter of political will. I think the tribesmen are being pampered. Mm. Unfortunately, uh, it's going to put us in a very difficult position in the next few years, you know, when he's gone. Yeah. And it has been, you know, commentary has followed or uh, trailed what came out of the UAE, where there was a list of Nigerians reported to be sponsors of Boko Haram. I honestly think the Nigerians waited for the government 
to say something, do something, like prosecute these people. Let's know their, let's see their faces. Let's see the government act. But it's safe to conclude the Nigerians have been disappointed. So, and, and I think that we can make assumptions, and I'm going to really give an opportunity to speak on this and what this can prove to the Nigerian people if the government acts otherwise. Or if the, if the Nigerian government acts um, in accordance to the expectations of the people. I think the government have an expectation of the government, and the government has a duty to the people. So when we come back, I'll give you an opportunity to speak on, on this and uh, tell us what you think by intelligence and its necessity needs to happen for the people's faith to be restored. We'll be right back. Nigeria Info. Don't go anywhere. Step ahead with the latest news and trending conversations here on 99.3 Nigeria Info. Don't tell people, are you added weight? Why are you losing weight? Yes. Are you eating? No, it's, it's not your business. That money, the pass is good. That money. We should be patient and pray to God that God is going to answer our prayer. Please, this is not all about prayer. You know, like, no, it's not prayer. Yes, prayer. That is Nigerian mentality. If you're not having happiness in your home, you pray. Your number one station for talk. Let's talk. You could be four debates away from one million naira. The good day, honorable judges, are ever attentive audience. That's the majority of core debates. We've crowned three I beg to differ debate champions. My name is Sanvita Kaushi. I'm Ruth Okocho. My name is Bella Diesa. And if you want to be the fourth, in fact, it even gives you a new global perspective. The quest to 1998 begins during the 2015 election. Now. The auditions for the next I Beg to Differ debate tournament are on. It's open to all secondary school students in Lagos, aged between 12 and 16. Just go to www.nigeriainfo.fm and click on I Beg to Differ and follow the instructions. Auditions close 3 p.m. July 12th, 2022. Let's build a healthy society. Support Nigeria sweetened beverage tax. So they are still taxing minerals, eh? Hmm. That's good. I beg. The government is just looking for ways to make life harder. With this tax, the people who manufacture minerals will start thinking about making healthier products. Then more people won't get diabetes. Hmm, that's true, Sha. If, for instance, this tax had come sooner, maybe I won't have diabetes. Yeah, maybe the tax is not so... Exciting news for all fashionpreneurs and fashion enthusiasts. You too can become a fashion entrepreneur. All you need to learn about the business of fashion, start up your own brand and become a voice in the fashion world is available and the training is 100% free. Simply download the Wazovia Academy app from the Google Play Store or iOS. Sign up for free and get trained online by experts in the fashion industry. It's smart and easy. You can access your training on your mobile phones without data after the first download and study at your own pace. Wazovia Academy. Learn and lead. This free training is brought to you by Wazovia Academy with support from Esmod and the French Embassy in Nigeria. We bring fun. Good vibes. We go in through the nick and come out through the cleaning. We even have very serious conversations. No, we don't. Oh, yes, we do. No, we don't. And that's what makes us ask you, what's, what's up, Lagos? <laughs> let's do this. I am Stretch. I am Marianne. And let's fire up your mid-morning from 10 a.m. to 12 noon on 99.3 Nigeria Info. Let's talk. Let's talk. Many people are in business, but not everyone means business. The people who mean business never say no to money, cash, card, or transfer. These ones grab business opportunities with their full chest. <laughs> Keep an eye on things that matter like people, cash flow, and how it all adds up. They do not only know their onions, they know their numbers. They mean business. With number, you mean business. Visit www.number.com, that is N-O-M-B-A, number.com, to get started. You know us in Port Harcourt. My name is Enor Ubevire. I'm Gabriella Anyamu. My name is Ade Dayo Ilushaki. You know us in Lagos. Hi, I'm Sheriff Quadri. My name is Joyce Onyemoa. I am Sandra Ezekwesili. You know us in Abuja. I am Femi D. Amele. Hello, everyone. My name is Swat. My name is Kimberly Machiko. Every day, our presenters in your city bring you real, in-depth talk on the biggest topics. But this June, you You'll hear all our presenters from all our cities at the same time. Join us at Nigeria Info's Roundtable. 
For three days, let's talk about the biggest stories of the last six months together. Tuesday, June the 28th from 10 a.m. to noon. Wednesday, June 29th from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. Thursday, June the 30th from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. The Nigeria Info Roundtable. Let's talk. You are listening to your number one station for talk. Your number one station for talk. 99.3 Nigeria Info. Let's talk. What makes radio the place to be? Well, that's because we start from here. Uh, this is a compound, not one, two or three, that somebody will come and say, I'm the only one coming in, in another one or two months. We will say that that place is like a market. Yeah, from one person to two to three to four, you don't even know those who are living in that kind of compound. You cannot say, where do you work? I'll rather worry, I'll tell you. Over here. I, I married my wife when she was very young, and now we have four children, and two has uh, finished university. They now hate me so much that I've, I've been cheating on her. I'm not happy with the marriage again. I don't feel love her, but she the, the way she treat me is the way I don't like it because she's insult me. She bring me to nothing, even in the front of my children. The time brings us here. People don't want to see what this government has done, and it's left for them. They want to be picking money on the street. They want government to be dashing money. Government is not for Christmas. Government will only really create the level. No, but the people. I don't think that's what the people want. To be honest, what do they, want? they don't want the government dashing them money. They want something that looks like a fair standard of living. Fair, like just good enough to be called a way to live. My work's done. The sun sets here. Mondays through Thursdays on your number one station for talk, ninety nine. Point three Nigeria Info. Uh, we're back, and my telephone lines are already blinking. I know you have questions for him. Hold on a second. I'm still on my own list. 99.3 Nigeria Info, the sunny side. We have with us a retired naval commodore, Kunli Olaomi, in the studio. And he was just to speak on the list um, from the Middle East that pretty much uh, gave us at least, not a lot, a few men who are reported to be sponsors of Boko Haram. Uh, sir, b- before the break, I wanted you to speak on it. And I wanted to highlight the fact that Nigerians believe that the government can act. The, gov- the people waited for the government to act. And in the absence of actions, Nigerians have been left with assumptions. In fact, it was in the commentary that followed subsequently that pretty much gave uh, wha- what I would say... Uh, what gave me insight into your thoughts people said to think that security agencies were not fit not good enough even though i think nigerians doubt it but the absence of anything better the absence of a better narrative proof of a better narrative what should the government have done with that and what does that say about how the world even sees us yeah i think to go straight to the point, you know, Nigeria is actually broken into three. That's we have the executive branch of government, we have the legislative, and we have the judiciary. Yeah. That is where the problem lies because the executive, the legislative, and the judiciary are supposed to have what we call separation of powers. In Nigeria today, there's no separation. The executive is the judiciary, the executive is the legislative. So, once there is no rule of law in any country, you are going to find yourself in a situation where terrorists were arrested. You couldn't do it in your country. Another country, Dubai, helped us to arrest a few of them, tried them in Dubai, send their names to us, and um, they are in their houses now. That's a very polite way to put it. Yeah, <laughs> they're in their houses now <laughs> with their wives and children uh, having fun. That wouldn't happen in any sane society. Let's face it. I'm, yeah. I'm not being anti-government or anti-system. Th- th- this would not happen in any sane society. Not yeah. even in Ghana. You're a terrorist. You've been arrested, convicted, sent down here, and you're in your house. The same thing with a lot of corrupt cases. So if, you, I mean, I learned that, I'm not too sure, they said the AGF you know, resigned today. The Ministry of Justice is where the challenge is because if there's no justice in any society, there'll be no peace in that society. Already we have a very corrupt system in terms of human development. You mm. know, I, I came late to your studio, why? The roads are terrible. I drove all the way from Adakuta through Songo. 
I mean, I was cursing myself till I came here. No way. The, the road was just horrible. Wow. You know, the infrastructural decay. Now, when you now add the injustice in that state, in Nigeria, to it, then you, you see everybody will do what they like. They, they, they will result to self-help. It becomes a jungle. Because if you have a minister of justice who actually announced that they have 400 Burundi chain related, you know, Boko Haram people that are being sponsored, you know, terrorism financing. Mm. He announced in April last year. Dubai also announced that these are the guys with evidence. They were tried, they were found guilty. And Nigeria refused to try those people. So I want to assume maybe they are tribesmen, you know. I that know. has been the speculation. Many so have assumed, oh, well, maybe the government doesn't want to do what the government should be seen yeah. to be doing. Uh, because maybe they're tribesmen. But if somebody from another zone, you know, commit that same crime, we see how EFCC goes after them and so on. So I think the problem that we have is injustice in the system. And when you have the wrong people in positions, such obvious. as AGF, the Minister of Justice, the Attorney General, you, 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 I think we just get what you go get you, you get know. what you get yeah um well i, I want to talk a little bit about negotiation only until recently uh an islamic cleric was trying now what does quite appear it doesn't appear to me that i understand where he stands but sheikh gumi did say that he was negotiating now that's the thing i'm not sure if he was negotiating on behalf of the government or if he was negotiating on behalf of the terrorist. But he was the middle guy who pretty much would go to the bushes and get hear the cries of the bandits and then bring it to the city. And he would tell us and the government what the band uh, bandits uh, uh, wanted. In fact, many times I've considered his speech. And at one time he said, oh, the government is aware. And the difficulty with that is is so what does the government do if there's a sheikh gumi who's an islamic cleric who is now that's the difficulty negotiation how does negotiation work and is it possible that we can have i, I don't think he's a state man a statesman in that sense and i mean sheikh gumi can we have a non-state actor negotiate on behalf of a government no Oh, well, that's, that yeah. was very direct. I actually studied negotiation at Harvard, you know. You mentioned earlier that I was in Harvard to study national and international security studies, you know. I mean, national and international security, yeah. So I studied negotiation. You know, the complexity is asymmetry. That's where the problem is. Okay. Negotiation is done basically when you're having a conventional operation. So look at what is happening to Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. You, you can negotiate because you know the actors. Mm -hmm. Ukrainians, they have the president. Mm -hmm. Russian to Putin, you have them. In this case, you want to negotiate with who? Very with a good. terrorist who has no name, no address? pedigree, no address, no... It's a non-state actor. How do you negotiate with such people? Okay, if you negotiate with, let's say, uh, one of them, and he agree with it, and second day, another faction decide that no we're not going that way then you go and negotiate with that faction another faction will come up tomorrow you can negotiate with that one so that's why mm. that idea of gumi doing what he was doing is very myopic very unprofessional and um you can see where it has gotten us to all the negotiation all the money that they've been paying billions of money that has passed through gumi to them has not yielded the desired result what he's doing is is reinforcing their confidence. When you negotiate with terrorists, what you're doing is that you are actually inflaming that movement. Mm. You're not going to get a result. They can if, if, even if you negotiate and the government, you know, get the result at the, in a short term, mm -hmm. his boys can sh just kill him overnight, and another one will come up and he, say yeah. he's not the new leader, and he ha this another agenda. He is you don't negotiate with terrorists they don't have principle they don't have doctrine they don't have any serious political uh demand that they want yeah so what are you negotiating for 
what you should do is to obliterate them. That has a solution. You obliterate them. The government should focus on obliterating them. And the only way you can do is, in this case, mm. is to go after the financiers, you know. Oh, that sounds very straightforward. Yeah, go after the financiers. They're the ones that are making so much money from this. And they're having political power. Because if you don't discuss with those financiers and you want to be a governor or a senator in your state, then you have not started. You have to negotiate with them. They are becoming the power broker in Nigeria. The terrorism financiers are becoming the major actor in the polity of this country. Oh. Be because they have the boys with weapons in the bush. <laughs> they basically have taken over that monopoly that is hitherto being enjoyed by the government. They have the men, they have the arms, they are financing it. And you want to be a senator or a chairman of a local government? You must talk to them. So it's beyond what we are looking. When I told the government last year that they should go after them, they do not understand. When I said that was the center of gravity of this insurgency, they do not understand. Oh. They are becoming the oh, power you have told broker. the government that this is, that, that's the yeah, I think there point was a of time gravity. I spoke on, I think, Channel's TV that, okay. that they should go after the terrorism financiers, that that is the center of gravity of this problem. Because if you don't, over the years, they're going to be the power broker. They are going to determine who is going to be the governor of any state, senators, chairman of local government, even the president. They are going to be. They are yeah. going to be the deep state. Absolutely. The government don't understand what I was saying that time last year. If you don't do it quickly, they're going to be so much powerful that they're going to determine the outcome of any election in this country. You know, I've wondered, and, and some people have said, and I think that they might be inaccurate, but it's safe to maybe revisit it since you're here. Some people have suggested that the uh, terrorists are more, are better armed than our security agencies and our military men, our, our frontliners. A and then that also informed another question. It's difficult. I don't know that the government has a specific figure as to how many they are. And then the question is if, they are no, if they're not just bordered now by the north, now they're coming down south, how many are they? And the implication of the, ca uh, of the question is how many arms do we have in the streets? Because it seems as though we can, we can no longer narrowly observe or look at this as a case of military or state versus terrorist. They're moving. They're cropping up. We're hearing cases of terrorists. Some say maybe they're not terrorists. They are bandits. But then if you follow their pattern, maybe you can say one is terrorist and the other is bandit. But these are free arms on our streets. And we don't even know how many. Yeah, I think the last time I visited the proliferation um, department in Abuja, I think they were talking about almost six million small arms, illegal small arms in Nigeria. That is huge. Six million? Yeah. That is huge. That's enormous. I mean, look at the population of the Nigerian defense sector. The entire population. We're not up to a million. And I can give you the figures. Army, Navy, Air Force, Civil Defense, Immigration, all of them, put them together. We're not up to a million. And you have six million illegal small arms in the system. If you look at the pictures or images coming from this Boko Haram, when you display the arms, you see maybe there are about 20 ragtag boys and they're having cache of arms that is overwhelming. But you know, let me try to help this country because it's not here to be criticizing the government or trying yeah. to, you know, let me help them. You see, the problem about education, for example, is what they call pedagogy, you know methodology how do you lecture what is the method depending on the students level and so on the challenge with our defense system is not that these ragtag hungry looking bush boys you know are better armed than us no oh it's not if i'm in the system i don't agree with that okay yeah the problem is the method the the, the tactics, the strategies the Nigerian government are using to face this issue. That is where the problem is. Okay. I don't have business running around like Tom and Jerry with these boys in the bush. I would never do that if I'm the commander in chief or if I'm the national security advisor. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to use a superior approach and I will take care of them without even losing a single man 
Look at how many men we are losing every day. That's possible. It's possible. Because it, it has appeared as though that's far-reaching, and maybe of uh, a construct of a dreamland. No. Mm. I, I train all over the world, you know. I've trained in Israel, I've trained in France. 99.3 Nigeria Info. We are more... Subscribe to our YouTube channel at Nigeria Info FM. Check us out on Facebook at Nigeria Info 99.3. Follow us on Twitter at Nigeria Info FM and on Instagram at Nigeria Info FM Lagos for live updates as it happens. 99.3 Nigeria Info. Let's talk.